So I'm going to tell you a story today that Jesus told first, and it's a parable. A parable is a, a true incident of Jesus telling a story that he made up to communicate a very important point. So it's a made up story told by Jesus. Jesus really told it, and he told it to illustrate an important spiritual point. Make sense? In every parable, you can find at least two people. You can find God and you can find you. And so I want you to look for both God and for you in this parable we're going to talk about today. And this parable is a thinker. It's not one of these parables that's just pretty easy to read and go, oh yeah, I get it. It's been uh, one of those things that I've spent the last 10 days on and it's just sort of um, had me wrestling. I've read all kinds of commentators, listened to all kinds of preachers and, um, and really am excited about it, excited to share with you, uh, I believe, what this means to us, what this means, what Jesus had in mind, uh, but it's something we'll have to work through together. Context is always important when we understand stories, when we understand scripture. For me to understand your context this morning, I would have to, to know some things. I would have to know what happened in your morning for me to understand your mood right now. Anybody in a bad mood right now? Uh, it's okay if you acknowledge that you're in a bad mood. I can tell that some of you may be in a, how about just a less than good mood? Anybody willing to acknowledge that you're, uh, you're struggling this morning? No one's brave enough to raise their hands. Um, I would raise my hand a little bit. I'm in a great mood now that I'm with you, but the morning kind of started off a little bit rocky for me. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it's missing last week. I missed you guys and getting back in the stride. Well, I would have to understand if you're in a bad mood, why? What happened? Um, if um, you're having a difficult day, if you're crying, if you're emotional, what's going on behind the scenes? What's happening in your life? What are your circumstances? When you say something to me, I can take it at face value or I can look at sort of the surrounding things that you've said to try to interpret it. And in this parable, Jesus had just finished saying some things that were very important. We're going to pick up in the book of Matthew, and the parable is called the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And Jesus had finished a couple of conversations that were important. The first conversation he finished was a conversation with a rich man who came to Jesus and he said, listen, I am keeping the law. I got all of it taken care of. I treat people well. I love God. I don't sin. What is it that I need to do to go to heaven? And Jesus said to him, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the guy said, okay, I'll do everything but that. Now, we know you don't have to sell everything and give it to the poor to go to heaven. This guy valued his possessions more than Jesus. And so the disciples kind of puffed up a little bit and they said, this guy isn't willing to give up everything that he has to follow you, Jesus. But we have, because Jesus called the disciples and they left their old lives behind and followed Jesus. And so they said to Jesus, are we going to get paid because we've decided to leave our old lives behind? We're the ones who've been with you for three years, or it wasn't three years at this point, two years. We're the ones who've been faithful. We're the ones who've been obedient. Are we going to, is it going to be our payday? Because this guy clearly doesn't love you like we do. And Jesus said, yeah, you're going to get paid, but it's going to be in a way that's totally different than you expect. And then Jesus said something, and you may have heard this before. If you've heard it, nod at me. If you're watching online, welcome, by the way. Uh, nod, even though I can't see you, well, I'll know what you mean. Have you ever heard somebody say this? The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Have you heard anybody say that? Do you have any idea what it means? Um, sometimes Christians, we have a weird sense of humor. We'll be standing in line and we're like, well, scripture says if I'm first, I'll be last. So I'm going to get in the end of the line so I can be first. We just do weird things that nobody else understands. And that has nothing to do with what Jesus meant when he said this. But at the end of Matthew 19, he says this. And the disciples are the ones who are hearing this. And then at the end of this parable, he says the same thing. The last shall be first, the first shall be last, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. And everybody's going, what's he talking about? But he put a parable in the middle of that. And it was the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Everyone understood vineyards. Uh, maybe you have a garden uh, at your house. Maybe you grow, maybe you have plants. My wife and I don't do well with um, gardens. Um, Joy does well with plants. We're not farmers, but they were living in a farming community where if you didn't grow, you didn't eat and they had vineyards and they made wine. 
And if you didn't grow and harvest, you didn't have a product. There were no Walmarts, no Targets, no high vs And everyone understood workers and vineyards and growing. And most likely, these vineyards occurred in the northern and eastern parts of Palestine in some rocky um, sort of hilly regions where they would kind of terrace the hills and, uh, and build in these little shelves or platforms where they could grow these grapevines. And in the spring, they would prepare the land and the summer, they would go and tie up the grapevines and prune the grapevines. And in the fall, they would harvest. And they were on a deadline because it rained in the fall. And if it rained, the grapes would rot. And so this story takes place in a vineyard in the fall. And they were on a timeline. And so the landowner had to hire some additional workers in addition to the normal crew that he would have had to try to make sure everything came in in time and nothing rotted. Are we all on the same page now? We got the setting. We got the context. You know what people would have visualized. You know the conversations Jesus was having before he told this story. And you know the proverb that kind of bookends this parable. And it's going to be important in a second for the principle to arrive home. And home is in our hearts. And what we hope is we live differently. So everyone's on the same page, right? We're good. I know it's summer. And by the way, thank you for being here. And thank you for not being on vacation. If you've been on vacation, thank you for being back. If you're online and on vacation, thank you for watching. And uh, everyone comes and goes. And I love the fall because we're all back together. And this morning right here, right now, it's a great morning. And this is a great message, not because it's from me, but because it's from Jesus himself. And I want to try to explain what I believe Jesus meant in this parable. So let's read together in Matthew chapter 19. Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire day laborers for his vineyard. Day laborers were a thing back in Jesus' day. In Deuteronomy, there was even a law that said if you hire a day laborer, you have to pay them by the end of the day so that they can feed their family. It was a common thing in Jesus' day. He agreed to pay these day laborers that he hired a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. And about nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. So he told them, you also go work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is fair. Now put in the back of your mind that he did not tell them how much he was going to pay them. He just said, I'll pay you what's fair. So at six in the morning, there was a 12 hour work day from six to six, six in the morning, he went out and hired some day laborers at nine, he went out and then he goes back again. Uh, and you'll see this right here. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and still found others standing around when there was only one hour left. And he asked them, why have you been standing around all day doing nothing? And they said, because no one's hired us. Obvious answer. And he said, you go work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with what? The last ones, because the last will be first and the first shall be last. He sort of weaves that in right in the middle, beginning with the last ones hired and then going to the first. Now, you have a sense of fair in your mind, right? You know what fair is. I know what fair is. Have you ever moved? Anybody ever moved? Um, some of you probably have the wherewithal, the means to hire somebody to come in and pack for you and, and to load the truck for you and to move it to where you're moving and take it and put it in the room where you're, you know, you want your stuff. And if you do, that's fantastic. I've never been um, afforded that luxury. I'm of the school. Uh, well, I have to pack my own stuff, Joy and I do. And we have to, we're at the mercy of our friends when we move usually. And, and so have you ever had a friend um, who has helped you move before? Have you ever been that friend? Now, if you ask your friends to move, you're going to find out who your friends are to help you move, right? You know. And who's the first one you ask? The one with the pickup truck. So that's always part of the bad thing of having a pickup truck. I have a really small pickup truck, by the way. I wouldn't be any help for you to move. It's just a little Tacoma. But your real friends come first, don't they? They come right at the first thing in the morning. They come. And then you always have that friend that had something they had to do. 
and they'll show up at say noon or three o'clock in the afternoon, but they'll bring a pizza or a flat of water and say, hey, I'm sorry, I was busy. My kid had soccer or whatever it was. And, and you're like, all right, you're here. That's a, more than a gesture. And then you've always got that one friend that just had something. They forgot, you know, their car broke down. They had to get a jump. They had a tire that got flat, some kind of made up excuse. And they show up right at the end of the day. They carry two things. And then after those two things are done, you're done, the move is over. And then they tell everybody they know how they helped you move all day, right? It's that one friend that just drives you crazy. And we have a sense of fair. And it's like, you didn't help me move. People who helped me move were the ones that were there all day. And so you had people who'd been there since six o'clock in the morning, some since nine o'clock in the morning, some since noon, some since three. And then a few that came at the very end, everyone had a sense of fair, and so the landowner, who, by the way, is God in this parable, says to the foreman, pay people what we owe them and start with the ones who were here last first. So this is what happens. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon, they came and each received what the early birds were promised. The ones who worked 30 minutes received a full day's wages. And this is what happened. The early birds start to do the happy dance because they say, we're getting ready to get rich. If they're gonna give these guys, these jokers who just showed up 30 minutes ago, a full day's wages, I might get paid for a week. I might get a month, who knows? And Jesus goes on and he says that they were really excited because they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered them and said, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for one denarius? Take your pay and go. If I want to give the one who was hired last the same amount of money as I give you, isn't it up to me to do right with what I have with my own money? And here's the million dollar quote, the point of this parable. It's the, the thing we have to unlock to be able to understand all of this story. He says, or are you envious because I am generous Does it make you jealous that I am generous with my grace? And everyone had to stand and listen to Jesus tell this story and put themselves in the shoes of the people hearing it and wrestle with their own idea of fair. And Jesus was explaining the upside down values of the kingdom of God and how it's unlike any other kingdom. And what's so clear to me is that wasn't the way that you built a huge crowd telling people this, but it's the way you install the truth and grace and truth are always married together. And Jesus always gave grace at the same time that he was and shared truth. And he says, for those who've been with me since the beginning, who do you think he might have been talking to directly? Disciples? Who think it's been this huge sacrifice to leave this life behind who think they deserve to get paid for being in partnership with me. Do you really understand what this new life is all about? Because grace and truth are best friends. And people had no problem with Jesus when he taught the truth, but they were scandalized by his grace. And so we have a diverging trail. We have a choice we have to make. Am I upset because Jesus is generous? Because I'll tell you a secret, I'm one of the ones who got there first. Um, as I mentioned to you guys last week, I believe, or two weeks ago, 
I mean, I was practically born in church. My mom and dad are here today, by the way, up here in the front. Doctors Rick and Shara Mellick from California, and I'm um, happy to have them here. I was born in church. I wasn't literally born in a church service, but I mean, I have negative nine months. I was in church. And when I was born, I was in church. I've been in church since before the workday started and I'm still in church right now. I've gone to more church services than anybody should or probably has in their entire life at my age. I'd win if there was a competition and there's not, thank God. I have crossed all of my T's, dotted all of my I's, checked all of my boxes, done all the stuff I'm supposed to do. And I kind of relate sometimes to that person who says that they were there early. 15 minutes early, they've been there the whole time. Well, I'm, isn't the reward going to be better or greater for those of us who've been faithful and left this behind? And Jesus is like, do you get it? Perhaps the reward is your faithfulness and being able to partner with me as you show people grace so that they can hear the truth. Now, the self-righteous person wants people to pay. They want other people to repent. They want them to agree with them. They're angry at people who are far from God. A chip on their shoulder. They want to see them grovel a little bit. And Jesus points out that that attitude is so far. Well, from Jesus' attitude, but it represented the Pharisees far more than it did this kingdom that Jesus came to communicate. But when a person really understands the truth and grasps God's grace and realizes what we're called to, well, it changes everything. And everything's what we're gonna talk about right after we sing these next songs and we come back and apply this fantastic story. Well, grace is just a word until it's been experienced. And the only way we can experience grace is through the gift of God given to us by the person of Jesus. And without Jesus, we can't understand grace. So here's the truth. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Here's the truth. All of us have sinned. Now, for those of us who may have been working since 6 a.m., have we sinned? Yep. Is my sin any less severe than somebody who maybe started working, say, at 5 p.m.? No, but I don't grade myself fairly. I look at myself sometimes maybe differently than you, and you might look at yourself differently than the people around you. We're gracious with ourselves, but often ungracious or ingracious to the people who are around us. The truth is that all of us deserve hell, every single one of us. I do, you do, we do. God's grace is demonstrated through Jesus that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And Jesus proved it over and over and over again. The woman at the well that Dan and Lori mentioned last week, the woman caught in adultery, Matthew, the tax collector, Zacchaeus in the tree, Rick Millick, the preacher, Brandon Smart, the youth pastor, Jared Matheny, the family pastor. Dan Schaus, the associate pastor. You, all of us, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus leaves with us, um, passes on to us the privilege, the opportunity to live in such a way or the people around us who may not have a relationship with Jesus yet can experience God's grace in this truth, but he expects people to see it in the way we live. So if you believe that being called out of an old way of life is robbing you of your fun, that you're having to toe the line 
and obey all the rules. And that if you weren't really a Christian, you'd be having so much more opportunities to enjoy yourself. Then we've never really understood grace. But as the disciples asked this question, aren't we going to get paid more because we're following you? Jesus' answer through this parable is you are being paid more because you are living in and extending the grace that I've given you to people as they come to have a personal relationship with me. So as each person gets paid, we celebrate. We see ourselves as the foreman taking the mantle from Jesus himself and passing on this grace to people who desperately need to see it. But we are ingracious, ungracious. We lack grace. So I'm gonna ask you to practice grace. I'm bad at it. I mean, I'm good at it sometimes. Sometimes I'm bad at it. And um, I was bad at it last week. We were on vacation. We got to go visit my uh, daughter-in-law and my son and my other son, and most importantly, my grandbaby, Emery Lorraine, who I have a thousand stories about, and I'm going to tell them all to you at some point, even though you don't want to hear them. And um, I just absolutely enjoyed myself for 10 days. I missed being here last week. I always miss being with you. But if I can't be with you, I'm telling you, I sure had a good time hanging out with little Emery. But Joy and I, we when we go there, um, we have a full-size bed and we're used to a king bed and we have a full-size dog who's used to a king bed and and so we don't always sleep real well and when you don't sleep real well you get grouchy and I was kind of on baby watch some and so you're listening for that little voice and down the hall and you know it's different for grandpa I'm not used to having many responsibilities at night and so I'm giving you all excuses and reasons why I was a little cranky and and Joy she said something to me one night she made me mad. She wronged me. She offended me. She said something to me. It wasn't that bad, to be perfectly honest. It wasn't even that offensive. I just took it wrong because um, that's just what I do sometimes. It made me mad. And I stewed over it. And I thought of all the things we're going to talk about and all the ways she was going to explain to me why she was sorry and how she didn't really mean what she said. And then we were going to talk about all the times that we would discussed it in the past and I repeated it in my mind. The next morning we woke up and she reached over and said, good morning. I said, don't good morning me. You know what you said. We got some things to work out. And then I started thinking about this passage and I'm like, well, if I'm gonna be a, uh, an example of God's grace, if I'm gonna live in such a way where people can see the grace of God in me and want the truth of God, uh, shouldn't I start with my wife? And I'm like, I'm not gonna start with my wife today. I'll start later. I'm gonna be mad for a while because it's more fun to be mad and to think about you know, what she's got coming. I started thinking about this passage and I'm like, well, man, she's forgiven me for a ton over the years, but it doesn't count. That was yesterday or last week or last month. And this happened, yes, you know, I've done a lot that she's just let go. And if I'm gonna live and be a grace practicer, if I'm gonna live in a way where I can, can show the world around me God's grace, where they're drawn to the truth, I should start with my wife. So then I decided I'm gonna be gracious. And in my benevolence, I made the decision I was going to say, Joy, you're way down here on the low road. I'm way up here on the high road. I'm going to give you grace in this situation. And that, I didn't say that. I thought that. That's not grace, is it? That's me putting myself above somebody. It's me making somebody grovel. So I explained to myself that grace is giving a gift. It's the gift of the benefit of the doubt. It's the gift of forgiveness. It's the gift of service. It's the gift of agape love. It's the same gift Jesus gave us. And I let it go because I could. Are you a husband or a wife who lives in a way that's so filled with grace that your spouse and the people around you see Jesus and want the truth? Do you parent in a way that's so gracious where you don't demand that your kids live up to an expectation to give them your approval, but you give your love and your support and your graciousness to them in a way where they can see Jesus in you. Will the concentric circles work out to your, your close friends, your coworkers, your church, perhaps even the world around you that sometimes it's really hard to love and be gracious to or towards? because sometimes people live in such an irritating and frustrating way. 
And we're so lacking in grace that if some of them end up in heaven, we're going to regret the way we treated them. And it's the opposite of what Jesus was leaving with us. Grace and truth always go hand in hand. People have a hard time seeing truth without experiencing grace. So I was working on this last week and came up with an acronym. Helps me, might help you, it may not. We're gonna do it anyway. G-R-A-C-E, the acronym for grace. The first one starts with a G and it's very simple. Goodness gracious, this is hard because I'm right and you're wrong. I deserve to be vindicated. You deserve to grovel. My sins are omissions and indiscretions. Yours are willful defiance and intentional attacks. Goodness gracious, this is hard. I'm the only one with any sense and all of you around me, you get the point, right? You don't deserve to get paid what I paid. You get paid. I worked all day. Goodness gracious, this is hard. Right now, seriously, let me ruminate on it. Let me let it marinate. Let me get really sour. It feels good. Right now. When's the best time to be gracious? Right now. When's the time to forgive? Right now. When's the time to serve? Right now. When's the time to love in a selfless love of choice? Right now. Because tomorrow is your enemy and tomorrow you'll put it off and it will never happen. Am I gonna play God and decide who gets grace and who doesn't? Or am I gonna commit to partner with Jesus? As Jesus ascended into heaven, and left this challenge with me. I'm gonna be gone, the Holy Spirit is here within you, empowering you to live in a way that's gracious. In the words of Rich Mullins, a deceased Christian song, Christian song artist, may mercy lead, may love be the strength in your legs with every footstep that you take, may you leave a drop of grace, may you live like the first one hired, celebrating every person who develops a soft heart and comes to Christ. Will we live in a way that as we move through our relationships and our life, people see Jesus and his truth because of the way we are gratefully gracious and scandalously generous so that the difference is unmistakable because our words lack unless our actions back. And then finally, and this is what I see in myself, and this is what you'll see in you, expect a miracle. But the miracle oftentimes you don't see in someone else. The miracle you see in yourself. And let me share something with you. This is what I want from us. As friends, as family, Together, I want us to become strong men and women of God with soft hearts, with gentle, gracious spirits. Strong men and women of God who live in a way where God's grace is unmistakable. And then people will see the truth. Because with Jesus and through Jesus, grace grace and truth were married. They were best friends. And as people wrestled with the truth, they often entered by seeing his grace. So that's what I'm going to pray for you and for me, that we don't have the entitled perspective of the prodigal son's older brother, for those who know the story, who were so upset when the younger brother came home because he didn't have to pay. The father gave him grace, but that we could have the heart of the father celebrating when one person softens their heart and enters the kingdom. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for my friends. And I pray that we would be filled with grace and not just grace for those out there, but that we would live your truth being gracious to each other 
beginning in our closest relationships. Our husbands, our wives, our boyfriend, girlfriend, best friends, kids, co-workers. They see the grace that we choose to give through humility and gentleness. And they see Jesus, that the truth will be easier to accept because of the way we live. That we don't make it more difficult as so many times we find ourselves doing as Christians. Turning molehills into mountains. Dividing the world around us. Attacking people who disagree with us. Demanding to be right, to be vindicated. To see our messed up sense of justice. I pray, Father, that you would break our hearts and allow us to live like Jesus so that everyone can see you even through our weakness as we depend on you to become strong men and women of God with soft hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.